Welcome everyone. I'm James Zervios, Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Obesity Action Coalition. Today, we are talking with Dr. Holly Lofton about some of the most common myths and misconceptions around obesity. Hello, Dr. Lofton. You are an obesity medicine specialist. In fact, you were in the top 10 physicians who passed the board examination for the American Board of Obesity Medicine. You are also clinical associate professor of surgery and medicine at NYU Langone. But our Obesity Action Coalition community knows you as Dr. Lofton from her service as a national board member and frequent speaker at our national meetings. We are thrilled to have you back with us today. How are you doing? I'm so happy to be here, James. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm doing well, and I'm happy to get the message out to our viewers. Well, thank you, Dr. Lofton. Let's get into some of the big myths about obesity people often hear. Some people still believe obesity is just a matter of personal choice. Why is it actually considered a chronic disease? Well, it is time to rethink obesity as a medical condition. And what I tell my patients is that it's characterized by a gland that is dysfunctional. And obesity is an issue of adipose tissue or fat cell dysfunction. So the fat cell is getting too big. When fat cells are big, they can cause stress in our body, such as knee pain. They can cause inflammatory responses that can lead to other conditions like diabetes and heart disease. So we're really thinking of shrinking this gland that we all have in our bodies to improve our longevity and overall health. Now, digging into what you just talked about a little bit more, there's a common belief that people with obesity have a slow metabolism. What does science really show about that? It's really interesting. It's to the contrary. Because the heavier a person is, they require more energy to stay at that size. So we actually see patients who have obesity have a higher metabolism than someone who has a, a smaller weight. And the reason for that is it takes more energy to run a body of larger size. And when we see weight loss, the metabolism in the same person actually decreases because there's less energy needed to maintain that smaller size body. Now, we talked about weight loss and body size. You know, most people think obesity is defined only by body mass index or, or BMI. Why is it important that we look beyond that number? Well, BMI or body mass index is a height weight ratio. And if we really look to this to determine everyone's weight goal, it would imply that everyone in the world who has the same height should be the same weight. And we know that's simply not true. Because we use this mathematical construct to define obesity in medicine, because it is easy to calculate, it doesn't mean it's the only way. Dr. Lofton, I was, I was about to interject and ask, because you, you kind of made me think of something in there. We, we talked about how we measure obesity, and you talked about maybe someone with obesity or severe obesity actually having a faster metabolism or, or taking more energy to, to, um, to, to function. But in thinking of that, there's the old school sort of thought process that eat less and move, move more really should solve the obesity issue. You know, why is that not true? Why is that false? Yes, we've all been given that advice to eat less, move more, create a caloric deficit. And we have to remember that our bodies are not mathematical tools. And this is evidenced by many people who have tried to calculate every calorie as well as how much energy they're spending, and they simply don't lose weight. That means there's something else going on than how much food you're taking in and how much energy you're putting out. We have to think about the effect of genes on one's weight and the ability to lose weight, the effect of the physiology of the body. Sometimes even medication someone's taking can make them more prone to gain weight. So we want to look at the whole picture here and not just the eat less and more. There was so much news today about medications for obesity, you know, every single headline. Some people believe that once you stop taking an obesity medication, you'll always gain the weight back. What's the truth behind that thought? Yeah. Well, I will say I've been involved in some of the trials that help get medications such as GLP-1 agonists on the market. And in doing those trials, we gave patients the medication. And then when the trial ended, we had to discontinue because the study was over. And I actually have seen people discontinue the medication who've lost weight and not gain a pound. When looking at scientific studies, we have to remember that all those lines and graphs we see are an average of about 2,500 people for some of these studies. So we're seeing an average weight regain in 2,500 people, but that means some people did gain weight after discontinuing and some did not. 
Now you talked about being a part of a lot of these clinical trials. Are all obesity medications the same or do different options work in different ways and maybe provide different results? Oh, James, obesity medicine is just like any other form of medicine in which we need to tailor the treatment for the patient. So all of our medicines we use for obesity are not the same. Some are solely for appetite suppression. Some are more for cravings or desire to eat. And others have multiple mechanisms um, for helping the fat cells shrink because we know that's the ultimate goal of the patients with obesity. Yeah, I think you see a lot today, this narrative and, and really driven a lot by the media that once you start one of these medications, you really don't need to make any lifestyle changes, right? And we know that's not true. So why is it important that even on an obesity medication that we still look at nutrition, behavioral things, and, and you know, how does, how does that help the patient? Yes, when looking at how we want to address the lifestyle aspect of taking a medication for weight management, keep in mind that in all the trials that were done, everyone in the trial was recommended to do what you said earlier, eat less, move more, see dietitians, work, up, work on your activity, because you want to create a real world idea of what happens when you take the medication, or if you're on the placebo arm, what happens when you just try diet and exercise the behavior modification alone. So the benefits in eating well and exercising when taking a medication for weight management are that it can really help decrease your risk of cardiac disease, other weight-related conditions such as diabetes, and ultimately help the medication work better for you. Now, Dr. Lofton, you recently worked with the Annenberg Center for Health Sciences on a 14-part video series clearing up some of these myths and misconceptions. What can people expect to learn from those modules? Well, I think what the those viewers from the Annenberg Health Centers for Sciences will learn is that obesity is not a disease that affects everyone the same way. In fact, one person can have different treatments for obesity as their life goes on. And then also it's more than just eat less, move more. Physical activity on its own does not necessarily help weight loss. And also we want to dispel some myths about weight bias. Unfortunately, weight bias is still quite prevalent in the world and in our country, even though the majority of Americans have a weight condition. So really getting to the bottom of how we think about obesity and people who are living with obesity will be some of the differences you might have after viewing this video series. Well, Dr. Lofton, this has been such an informative episode. Thank you for breaking down these myths and helping us understand the facts. It's conversations like this that make it easier for patients to get the respectful, evidence-based care they deserve. Thank you again for sharing your expertise, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great day.